Hello and welcome to Muskrat Nicks. This is Muskrat Nick, and this is the first in our video series on the Battle of Hoax Run, which is going to be a black powder game using the Glory Hallelujah supplement. How I'm going to be approaching these is I'm going to be going over the history of the actual battle first, and that's pretty much going to segue very nicely into an order of battle, which is what you're looking at right now, uh, part of the order of battle for the Confederate forces. Um, and after I go over the order of battle, I'll go over special rules in our scenario that we decided to use. And then probably throughout and maybe at the end, I'll have some uh, sort of designer notes, what I was thinking, why I made to, why I chose to make the decisions that I made to represent this battle on the field. Um, so with no further ado... Uh, the history. Now, this battle happened to occur on July 2nd, 1861, which is actually kind of ironic because uh, completely unintentionally, the first battle for my channel, I chose to fight on the actual anniversary of the actual action, completely by chance. Uh, we fought this battle on July 2nd, 2020. And that would have been the hundred, I believe, the hundred fifty ninth anniversary to the actual battle that occurred on July second, eighteen sixty one. On July second, uh, Major General Robert Patterson's division crossed the Potomac River near Williamsport, Maryland. He marched along the Martinsburg Pike, and two Union brigades encountered Colonel Thomas Jackson's brigade. Uh, they haven't quite earned the name Stonewall yet. That happens in a few days. Uh, the Union Brigades were the 1st Division, 1st Brigade, under Colonel John J. Abercrombie, and 2nd Division, 6th Brigade, under Colonel George H. Thomas. And historically, uh, Colonel Jackson had the 5th Virginia Volunteer Infantry and one gun he brought to the front. The other units he had break camp and they were in reserve, but they never were brought into the battle. And the reason for that was because um, General Johnson, who was in charge of the entire the Army of the Shenandoah at this point, General Johnson had very specific rules for Colonel Jackson and how he was supposed to interact with the Union forces. Uh, his orders were to delay the Federal advance and then to withdraw. The actual historical battle took something like 45 minutes, and uh, he actually failed. This battle is listed as a Union victory. However, this Union victory caused the Union commanders to react in an unexpected way. This is a case of winning the battle and losing the war. On July 3rd, Major General Patterson occupied Martinsburg, but he didn't make any further ad aggressive moves. He waited until July 15th, where he moved to Bunker Hill. And then instead of moving on to Winchester, he turned east to Charlestown, and then he withdrew to Harper's Ferry. Uh, this relieved a lot of pressure on the Confederates. This allowed uh, General Johnston to support Brigadier General P.G.T. Beauregard at the Battle of Manassas, where Colonel Jackson earns the name Stonewall, and the Stonewall Brigade is truly born. So we're going to go into the order of battle, which I have typed up pretty nicely here. You'll see that I have Brigadier General Joseph Johnston. Um, one of my approaches to these games is that... I don't want to make an actual historical refight because if we do that, then pretty much we can count on probably the same results. Um, so what I like to do is I like to find a battle and I like to try and look at a kind of a, a plausible what if scenario. And like I said, historically Jackson took to the line with the 5th Virginian Volunteers and one gun, but he had an entire brigade at his command. So what would have happened if he decided to delay the Union advance with his entire brigade? And with that in mind, I decided to allow Joseph E. Johnson to actually be present because he's going to be watching Jackson. Jackson, at this point, was 
acknowledged as a Confederate leader and a major important person, but there's still some question, you know, he, he hasn't earned the name Stonewall yet. So he kind of has to prove himself to a certain degree. So Johnston is going to be on the field, but he's not actually going to be commanding the units. He's going to be supervising the operation. He's going to let Jackson do Jackson, and Johnson is going to do see what happens. And if there would be a catastrophic failure, well, then, of course, Jackson, or excuse me, Johnson would step in. Um, so you can see that I have that Johnson can attach himself to any unit in his brigade, giving them plus one attack die. And then we have our first brigade under command of Colonel Thomas J. Jackson. Uh, straight out of the Glory Hallelujah book, he has a strategy rating of nine. Um, his actual special rule is decisive, and that is actually the second bullet point. He can re-roll a failed command roll. If the re-roll is another failure, then it is a blunder. Uh, if he takes a re-roll from Johnson per black powder, that re-roll would trump that special rule. And since I want Johnson to be overseeing but not particularly getting involved, I decided that it would be best that Jackson would not benefit from Johnson's re-roll. So um, also, straight out of Glory Hallelujah, Units within 12 inches can re-roll failed break tests. This makes his units a little more resilient in the field. I uh, also remember in a couple of days from the Battle of Hoax Run is Manassas, where he earns the nickname Stonewall. Uh, he can attach to any unit within his brigade to give him to give that unit a plus one attack die. Pretty standard there. And then you'll see I have the three Virginian units that were actually present and under Jackson's direct command. Um, all of this is taken straight out of Glory Hallelujah, so it is as you see it there. I did allow them all to be elite and stubborn so that they are just that much more resilient to... They're coming into their own at this point. Um, and then the first Roxbridge artillery, that's representing the one gun that was brought up. Again, they're part of the brigade too, so why wouldn't they be elite and stubborn just like everybody else? And let me shimmy this down a little bit. We are, the second brigade is actually going to represent Lieutenant Colonel J.E.B. Stewart, Jeb Stewart's command. It kind of appears that Jackson allowed Jeb Stewart to do Jeb Stewart because in the order of battles that I was able to find, it did list Jeb Stewart as being present, but he operated separately, sort of. So I'm representing that by taking Jeb Stewart straight out of Glory Hallelujah. And he is aggressive and headstrong. Now, that means that he cannot benefit from the Commander-in-Chief's role. I believe that's actually part of Headstrong. He can never benefit from that role. Um, he's aggressive, and that means that he receives a plus one to his strategy rating for any charge order. His strategy rating is nine, so that brings it up to ten. And also as part of Headstrong... If and only if Stuart is the first commander to be given an order, he receives a plus one to his strategy rating. However, 11 and 12s, they count as a blunder. So it, it, these do stack. So he could theoretically have a leadership, a, a strategy rating of 11 because the plus the two plus ones. Uh, and as per every leader, he can attach to any unit in his brigade. Um, how I chose to represent the 1st Virginia Cavalry is to break them up into two small regiments, two small operational units. Um, it just seemed like that gave an actual brigade feel to Stuart. Uh, I, I actually got the idea out of the Black Powder Rule Book. There's a battle report for the Battle of Kernstown where uh, the author took Ashby's cavalry and did the same thing. Uh, I made them brave, and I gave them pour it on just to give them a little bit of an edge in combat, as it were. And that is the Confederate Order of Battle, so I'll move this aside, and then I'll bring out 
the Union Order of Battle. Um, these are nice little player aids that I made that kind of hopefully will help us out in our actual play of the battle. And uh, now you notice at the top that the Union doesn't have a Commander-in-Chief. I chose to do it this way because we actually have two different divisions, which have two different division commanders, and then the overall army commander. It seems like there's a lot of levels of command that I didn't really want to represent on the field. Um, now this does mean that the Union doesn't get any rerolls once they're deployed, but the idea is that I had was to make it easier for the Union to get onto the field, but not necessarily easier to do anything on the field. And so to do that, I gave them automatic rerolls to their command rolls. I gave them a plus one, representing higher echelons of the Union command. Uh, this is in addition to the plus two, because they will all begin the game in marching column formation along the Martinsburg Road. So here I have the Department of Pennsylvania, 1st Division, 1st Brigade, Colonel George H. Thomas, strategy rating of 7. Uh, I probably should make that an 8 just to give the Union a little more m maneuverability, but 7 is statistically the highest number on 2d6, so I should be in pretty good shape there. And his only thing is that he can attach to any unit in his brigade. So that's pretty standard. And uh, the three Pennsylvanian regiments of infantry, all with rifled muskets, uh, that actually stands to be explained. Uh, you'll notice that the 4th Virginian Volunteers, they have rifled muskets. Everybody else has smooth bores. This is because the 4th Virginian Volunteers uh, contained VMI troops, troops from the Virginia Military Institute, and they were armed with a kind of a light rifle, if you will. And there were a few rifles floating around at this time. Uh, they haven't made it completely up to all of the units, so I thought I'd give one rifled musket unit just to represent some of that on the field. But you can see the Union is much better supplied, so they've all got rifled muskets. Um, I do have the 2nd U.S. Cavalry. They're listed in the order of battle for the battle. There actually, there's two cavalry units listed. There's one company of, I believe, Philadelphia Cavalry, and then three companies of U.S. Cavalry. I kind of figure the, being a federalized system, the uh, single company from Philadelphia, militia type, would be subservient to the U.S. Cavalry, probably would end up part of their command. Um, so I made them one unit, and that makes four companies, which is roughly half a regiment, so it made sense to make them small as well. Since they're U.S., again, straight out of glory, hallelujah, they're, I'm allowed to make them steady and brave, I did also give them marauding, which will kind of better represent, it seems to me like this cavalry would definitely be doing the advanced scouting type thing. So um, that better represents their role as scouts. And then the heavy artillery that was assigned to the brigade, that was historically brought up to bear against, um, against Jackson. So that is 1st Division, 1st Brigade, and here we have a small 2nd Division, 6th Brigade under Colonel J.J. Abercrombie. Again, strategy rating 7. Probably should have made it an 8, but we'll see what happens. Uh, we've got three units in this brigade. The 11th Pennsylvania, just a regular Joe Blow infantry. And then there were Philadelphia Independent Rangers. This is a tiny unit. They are listed as having received casualties. So I thought, why not? Throw them in. Doesn't matter. Um, then there's the 1st Wisconsin, the only non-Pennsylvania unit present. This is a little bit of a vanity move here. Um, I've decided to treat the 1st Wisconsin as U.S. regulars. And the reason I chose that is because, according to the after-action reports, they actually captured regimental colors. So, 
they actually did something that was considered really a big deal in the Civil War. That's the, the two things that an infantry regiment wanted to capture in battle. It was not the commander. It was not men. It was the regimental flags of enemy units. Then you have truly defeated that enemy unit. And it was artillery pieces. Artillery pieces were a major point of honor and a focal point in many, many battles. So the 1st Wisconsin, they captured regimental flags. So they were kind of cool. And uh, also a little bit of vanity. I am actually distantly related to the commander of that unit. He's like a fifth great uncle of some sort. So I kind of had to make him special. So that's our order of battle. The battle actually has, and while I'm going through this, I'll flip through some pages of Glory Hallelujah so that we have some eye candy. Um, so, all right. I figured it was a good idea to represent the Confederates as being blind, as it were. Um, not necessarily blind, but uh Concealed. Concealed is a much better word. The Union um, didn't necessarily know what was in front of them. So what I did is I gave the Confederate units all have a uh, card. And on that card is listed on one side the actual unit, the regiment that, that the unit represents. And the back side is blank. So my opponent will place those cards out first. And then I, he will be able to move those cards, but all of the cards move independently with a strategy rating of 9. Um, as you were, they will have a strategy rating of 7. And they will only be able to move 6 inches. This is restricting their movement seems to be a good idea as it's not meant to be... The, the, the orders that the Confederates have are very, very specific. They're not supposed to be um, attacking. So when a unit is revealed, he, he will have to put his command base on that card, and then he can form the unit as he sees fit around that command base. How those units are exposed, he can either do it voluntarily at the start of his turn or before shooting, or I can have a unit within 12 inches. As soon as the unit's within 12 inches, he exposes the unit, the, Cal the Confederate unit. And um, the, the only other way is, yeah, shooting. And uh, yeah, yeah, so it's shooting. If he chooses to shoot, he exposes. He can voluntarily expose, or I can be within 12 inches. Um, the cards cannot be interacted with in any way by um, units on the table. Any unit deployed on the table cannot interact. So they, the cards can't be targeted by the union. The command ratings of deployed generals can't be applied. Nothing applies to them except um, unless they are deployed. So that just helps the Confederates be a little bit more secretive in where where they go where they go. And I actually have to find them as the Union. Um, the Union, I explained their deployment rules. Those are the only special rules. The turn that's going to be a five turn game. And on turn five, at the end of turn five, we're going to roll a d6. On a three or better, we're going to play turn six. And on turn six, we're going to roll again. On a five or better, we're going to play turn seven. And the game ends at turn seven. The objective is for the Union to make it off the southern board edge. Units have to make it off the southern board edge, thus making it around Jackson's little roadblock. So um, I think I actually said everything with my designer notes here. Uh, so I don't, I think uh, we're climbing on 20 minutes. I'm sorry for the long rambling thing, but hopefully this gives you a better idea about the size and scope of our battle. Um, 
It, it is worth noting there is one part of the battle that I chose not to include, and that's because uh, to the far, far right of the Union line, there was the 15th Pennsylvanian, which elements of Stuart's command took 40 uh, prisoners. The thing is, it's kind of far away from the battle, and it seems like it really didn't affect the battle at all. So I chose to just completely not represent that. Also, those are units from a different uh, brigade in uh, 2nd Division. So it was easier to just spread it out like this. Uh, there are units in the uh, 2nd Division 6th Brigade that I didn't include, strictly because they were not on the order of battle. The Union force is pretty much straight out of the order of battle. Uh, the Confederates are sort of the alternative if Jackson brought his entire brigade to bear. So uh, that's it. I hope you enjoy the battle. And uh, maybe after the battle I'll do another video. Hopefully it'll be a little quicker. Um, for like an after action report. My thoughts on how the battle went. And that sort of thing. Alright. So thank you. I hope you enjoy the battle report. Have a good day.